Might as well get the ball rolling. Welcome to the May 16th, 2019 Finance Committee meeting of the School District of Upper Dublin. Um, we do have one presentation, which is our very favorite budget presentation. I'm just going to call to order and dive right into that. So at the beginning of the year, we talk about having, I think, 18 different budget presentations. We're getting down to uh, the end of them. Um, and the first slide that you have before you this evening is um, something that you saw on April the 29th, showing a fund balance of $5,138,623. Uh, and that's before we have the rate stabilization fund and uh, the assessment commitment to add on top of that. And just to illustrate the what happens over a year of time, um, I just want to call to your attention that last year at this point, or the final budget that we're coming to the end of in, in 1819, um, the projected uncommitting ending fund balance at that point was about $1.2 million. So over the year, we've had some good information, some good successes, and that amount has grown. But also, the number at the top was only predicted at that point in time to be about $5 million. So the thing with fund balance is each year, um, if, if we land a little bit better than what we've projected and predicted, um, fund balance will continue to grow. And a million dollars, $3 million is a swing, but when you consider that we have $100 million of revenue and $100 million of expenditures, the variation or the, the variance percentage-wise isn't quite as staggering. But uh, millions of dollars to most people sounds like a lot of money. Next, also as of April the 29th, looking forward, again, we only have projected next year $1.5 million, and that was as of April 29th. So now we're going to talk about some significant changes that have occurred since April the 29th and we're, as we've tried to quantify them. And, and we predicted or told you that we would be doing that at this particular meeting. Um, and just want to remind everybody, if when revenues decrease, fund balance decreases. If revenues increase, that's the easy one. You know, if, if uh, revenues increase, fund balance is going to increase. Expenditures is always a little, it's the opposite. So as we go through and we do the addition and the subtraction, bear with me. Uh, Jen and I have gone over this and we've had somebody else to make sure that all of our pluses and minuses are appropriate. And then there's always the check and balance because it, when you drop it into the PDE 2028, you better get the same uh, final figures. So again, going back to that $5,138,000, it's in a particular color of blue for a reason, April 29th. Um, the revenue adjustments for this year are really pretty basic at this point. Interest, we're going to pull it, increase it $200,000 this year. So total revenue adjustments since last month, $200,000. Expenditure adjustments. Tonight, later on in this present or in the meeting, we're going to discuss transferring four hundred forty-seven thousand um, dollars to this one is to the debt service fund. Excuse me, I had to pause for a second to think about which uh, other fund we're uh, going to transfer that to. Uh, we did we transferred the same amount last year, and this is from a particular building or um, you know revenue stream coming in from the Fort Washington office park, and we've talked about uh, using that particular revenue stream to pay for the addition or the, excuse me, the renovation, the construction of the new Sandy Run. So we're going to transfer, it's our recommendation, and then on Monday night I hope you approve that transfer. We have various other adjustments across six different accounts for regular ed tuition, uh, change and approve private school, we just lumped those together. Um, so we have total 
expenditure adjustments of $406,000 since last month. So overall, if you take the add the revenue, subtract the expenditures, we're now predicting that ending fund balance in the general fund will be 491 or $4,931,898. It gets trickier in the next year. More adjustments. Um, so beginning with 1920, ending fund balance as of April 29th, again, that $1 million, $1.5 million figure. Um, since we're moving forward, we have to take the uh, net adjustments from 2018, 19, and, and put that amount and consider that when we're calculating fund balance for next year. But the piece is going to take a little bit of time, and I think what we want to discuss is also something that's on the agenda later on this evening. Um, assessment appeal that the stipulation is included and will be before you for approval on Monday night. There are two pieces to this assessment appeal. One is a permanent reduction in um, assessment, hence a permanent reduction in um, revenue. It won't just be for next year. It's based on a reduction in the assessed value of $19 million, plus or minus. Um, so right now, and there may be some tweaking to get it to um, agree perfectly with the stipulation, but $650,000 reduction based on that assessment. We could pay um, for the assessment um, cash, or we can use it as a combination of credits. And although it's not on tonight's agenda, our, our attorneys have been working with the owner's attorneys to, uh, instead of requiring a cash payment, that we would extend credits to Prudential over the next two years. So you will note that we have factored out $1,165,000 of revenue for next year because essentially what would happen in the year 1920 is for that particular parcel, parcel of property, there would be no tax revenue at all. In 2021, there would still be some hangover uh, and there would be um, par partial reduction that year on that parcel, um, and, but not entirely. In comparison to the real estate, uh, the assessment, the amounts on the slide at the bottom are minor. Uh, real estate taxes, we pulled the um, 74569 That was the placeholder that we had in place or had been uh, in revenues and then uh, use the um, property tax reduction amount that was afforded. Uh, we'll also go over that a little bit later. Um, property tax amount did increase slightly for the year, and um, as well as the amount per approved um, homestead, but more on that later. So the combination of all of those changes um, in the gray between the two gray lines is uh, one million. $814,000. Moving ahead to other revenue adjustments, on a positive note, at least in the general fund, uh, $200,000 of interest income for the next year. We're reducing, expecting a reduction in PEASERS and uh, FICA of $78,540, and that's the result of some salary numbers that we'll be going over shortly. Always remember that 50% of um, FICA and PEASERS ends up coming in as a revenue, a state revenue item. Next, under expenditures, we have so that we can um, properly classify them for the PDE 2028 as well as um, our own um, budget for next year. You will note the retirements uh, and pers uh, due to the personnel changes of teachers or the professional staff that we know of this time. Again, there are seven, and that's the amount of money that uh, we have calculated for those seven adjustments or for those seven retirements. Ms. Bray, I do want to yes, just make one comment. We are replacing all seven positions. Um, there has been some question out in the community 
as to how many we are replacing, we're replacing all seven. Thank you. Does, does this number include uh, an offset for the new salary for those replacements, or is this just the savings and then there's an uh, additional? It's, it's just an the offset. offset. Okay, thank you. And we've used for the offset what we normally hire, the positions or the, the step. Other expenditure um, adjustments are health insurance savings. We discussed that, $450,000, um, based on our exceedingly good experience that we've had uh, the last year. It's, it's been phenomenal. Um, also, I want to recall to everyone's um, attention that on the next line, the 5100 Sandy Rim Middle School uh, GOB debt reduction. Maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but trying to keep it on a slide. We had a million dollars plugged in there before, and, and the amount came out to be about 363000 something along that line. So we were able to reduce that expenditure by that by a significant amount of money. Um, and then <clears throat> reduced capital um, under the 5200s. We have um, reduced capital transfers. We had $2 million on that line item, if you recall earlier. And we have brought that down to be the same as what it is the, the current year, $1,458,000. Um, and I will pause here just for a second, because most likely we'll be close to having all the debt service borrowed next year for Sandy Run. So this is the, probably the last year that you'll be talking about or we'll be talking about debt fall off, uh, the, what, which occurred in 1516. Um, next year that money will still be in the 50 or in the 5,000 function, but it will be used as debt service most likely. And when I say next year, I mean 2021. And we have various adjustments of uh, from three other accounts, totaling $27,050. So altogether, total other adjustments, total expenditure adjustments if you're adding up the gray lines. And when you go back and do all of the math, the estimate estimated June 30th, 20 ending fund balance as of today is $1,699,263. So this is just simply restating and putting everything together and showing the, the, the difference or the, the updated numbers. Um, at this point, um, again, there's still a commitment for assessment appeals. Um, and we have, after we settle the significant one that we've been discussing, we'll, we still have about 13 other appeals, uh, none of, even close to the magnitude of this. Um, but there, that money certainly could be used to settle the smaller ones. Um, and then the uh, $2.6 million later on, uh, we will be asking for that motion to be approved without um, attaching a dollar amount at this point. Talking about property tax reduction, which I mentioned earlier, you can see the total dollars available for um, this year is, again, slightly up $2,572,630 compared to last year's you know, $2,495,000. Interestingly enough, we have exactly the same number of properties. That is a little bit unusual. It usually wiggles um, you know, two or three or four based on properties that are, have been sold and uh, you know, new, the new owners applying for homestead, but this year it is, to this point, seven uh, seven thousand two hundred seventy six, uh, and sometimes we we do continue to receive uh, adjustments to that. So between now and the time we pass the budget, or the budget's passed on June, the number may change by one, and we'll have to recalculate it. But at this point in time. You can see what the assessed value, that it, that's increased, as well as the dollar reduction uh, going up to the $353,000 or $353.58. So used to speaking in larger dollar amounts. So, and I probably should have mentioned early on that the revenue that we were talking about, um, and I didn't hit it that hard because we've seen that slide so many times, still includes a 2.3% tax increase. 
This slide is what we saw last month um, at both the board meeting as well as our uh, committee meeting last month. Um, and, you know, the other amounts on there, are, it's calculated at a 97% collection rate and the average assessment of $195,000. I do believe the median has increased to 196310 it, it did increase a bit this year, but nothing significant. Future considerations, I want to take a moment. Um, a lot's going on at the state. Um, it's been interesting to see my colleagues, and we've been exchanging emails as to what the benefit is for different districts. We right now are slightly, they're saying we might receive a bit more than what we have, but um, some districts have found that their allocations have been reduced. Um, at this point, we're not including any of that money, which I believe is about $117,000 for uh, the regular ed, if I remember correctly, and 36000 41 sorry, for special education. Um, but that's not included. And one other thing while I'm speaking about special education, I'm sorry, Dr. Yanni, uh, is that um, we have found out that we will not be receiving any of the contingency fund money this year. Uh, we've been successful in uh, securing that money for, I believe, the last three consecutive years of an amount nearly $100,000. But this year, um, we learned that there was just too much need, higher need in other districts, and we did not, we will not be receiving any money for 1819. In addition to what Ms. Bray said about the state budget, we're also watching federal funds, Title I, Title II, and Title IV. Um, Usually we get um, some information in the April mm -hmm. time frame. The information is still not, um, has still not been received by districts. At our most recent superintendent's meeting, we may not know until August or September what federal funds we will receive. Uh, just as a reminder, Title I funds go to pay salaries of reading specialists. Title II and Title IV are professional development. Um, for some comfort for the board, um, we usually retroactively charge things to Title II and Title IV for professional development, and that um, will cushion if uh, we don't receive as much as much money as we were hoping for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bray. Are there any comments or questions from members of the board? Mr. Sirota? Does the homestead reduction amount, so this, it's a change of about $11 this mm -hmm. year. Does it normally move that much? In my head, it doesn't normally move that much, but I don't know if that's true or not. It, um, it has moved, it, uh, it'd be interesting to graph it. Um, no, but I, it doesn't usually move that much, and I, I can see Jen's already good looking for it. Um, I know one year it moved $9, but it, the amount is more than what we anticipated. So uh, that's not a scientific, I can all have that ready for you on Monday night. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? No? Okay. Oh, no. go ahead. Uh, when do you want final input on the tax increase? Is that Monday night at the legislative meeting? I think Monday night would be fine. Um, Dr. Yanni, do you want, shall we have the discussion tonight? I'm comfortable having the discussion anytime. Uh, you know, I, we're going to continue looking at the budget all the way through budget adoption. So I don't know that we need to have a definitive answer tonight or even a definitive answer on Monday evening. Um, but I, I do think some conversation is warranted so that we at least know where the appetite of the board, the board is moving forward. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any, uh, I'm leaning in the direction of the 1.99 tax increase, but I haven't made up my mind yet completely. I don't know if there's any comments or questions regarding the other samples we saw on in the presentation. I would be leaning toward the higher end because I think there are a lot of unknowns going forward, especially with the Sandy Run project.
Anyone else care to comment? I mean, I think we can continue to, it sounds like we can continue to keep our options open, although I think I'm sort of hesitantly in Joan's camp in terms of the reassessments or the assessment appeal. Even though we're in the final stages of negotiation, it's still not a tremendously favorable outcome. And some of the other developments really haven't come online yet. I think decision making will be up to the last minute. It feels that way. Um, if there are, are so, any other. Uh, oh, the, fi the final number needs to be in June. I mean, you don't have to have the final number when you do the proposed final budget. No, we, we do not. Okay. I mean, Just and that's you. what, and we have, but we have prepared the PD 2028 and we'll be advertising and placing it on, on public view, including the 2.3 um, percent okay. Okay. Um, at this point. I'm sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Um, I'm, I'm at a 199 right now as well um, and looking at what the uh, projected uh, uncommitted fund balance is um, the change from uh, April to now um, is favorable to the district even considering um, the assessment appeal uh, which is still negotiating so I'm not obviously 100% where we're at but based on that and to see where that uh, projected fund balance looks for next year um, I'm comfortable with the 199 okay Mr. Sirota? I, I, I've said this before, but I'm going to re repeat in general, and then I'm going to give a, a number. I think um, I do think the number has to be below the index. Uh, we've had a long-term trend of having a smaller tax increase year after year, and I, um, I believe it's time to stop that um, metric and start considering it as a percentage of the Act 1 index. Uh, my... I, I think it needs to be uh, most of the Act 1 index, and I'd like to have a target number that we can shoot for every year um, to be there. And I think the number right now is if we go to 90% of the Act 1 index, that makes us one of the lowest in the area. The only ones who are going to be lower than that, I think, for the most part, are going to be districts that have some special story to tell, like they just got a $25 million donation, for example, um, or they're trying to spend down fund balance that they've built up or that kind of thing. But for those districts that are in steady state, I think 90% of the Act 1 index will keep us at near the lowest in the area, which will improve our value over time while still uh, having us at an increase um, that will sustain our budget going forward. So uh, that number this year would be 2.07. Um, and, uh, and because I'm generally allergic to just pulling numbers out of the air, uh, I know that doesn't end in a nine, and we have had this habit of ending in a nine, but um, to me, those are just marketing numbers, uh, and I'd rather do this 90% of the index as, as a metric every year. So my number right now is 2.07. The 90% the of the index is is a nice idea. I wouldn't want to commit too much to I mean, it would always be under... Well, we can't find future boards no matter what. Right. Um, sure. But... Right, that's a target that I would have going a forward, and it's as a target, and obviously it's always just the starting point for discussion. Tizia, um, why ninety percent? I actually um, put a lot of effort into this. I I graphed um, everybody's tax increase in the entire Act One era in Greater Philadelphia as a percentage of the index. Um, and looked at it as a whole, and the graph is really ugly and messy, and I can show it to you if you really want to see it, um, uh, because it has, you know, 70-ish districts on it. Um, but uh, when looking at it as a percentage of the index, 90% gets you pretty much at the bottom of the most districts that are in sort of steady state, the ones that don't, like, jump around a lot, basically toe the line on the index. So they... Some of them are you know, like 2.2 percentage points below the index or right at the index, but those districts follow the index. 90% of the in index gets us sort of at the bottom of that group of, of districts that, that toe the line. So it'll be, I think we're, we can be in a steady state and like them, and I think that gets us at the low end of that, so we're lower than almost everybody that way. We would be, I think Methacton this year would be below that, and Abington is going to be below that. 
Um, and in Montgomery County, or at least Southern Montgomery County that I've been paying close attention to, I don't think anybody else is going to be below that this year that I'm aware of. You mean below 199? Below, below 207. The 90%. Below 90%. Anyone else with comments? Well, there's lots to think about still. Um, many, many, I'm sorry. Amy, did you have? I, I'm just looking at the information that I've pulled together from um, other districts that we'd like to compare ourselves to. And most everyone is really close to the Act 1 index. In fact, several of the districts around us are ab above Act 1. And they happen to be um, the districts that are starting to do construction. So, you know, Wissahickon's pretty close to 3. Colonial's close to 4. Um, and, and a, a lot are right now floating right around the index. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just need to repeat as the CFO that with losing $655,000 of forever revenue until such time as we start adding on, you know, things start coming online, uh, I, I'm concerned about doing anything other than going to the index with construction coming as well. But I don't vote. That's just my counsel. Thank you very much. Yeah, that. to clarify those in terms of preliminary or proposed final budgets, Wissahickon is at 285, Upper Moreland's at 290. Um, I'm trying to see which other ones. Uh, Methacton is at 186. They're and the I low. have no idea how they calculated that number. <laughs> uh, Lower Moreland, I don't think I have an updated number for Lower Moreland. Three, uh, 340, I think, is the mm -hmm. correct number. I'm not sure if that was preliminary or proposed final. I didn't note that in my, in my notes. Um, yeah, okay. Chel Cheltenham. Uh, I don't have Cheltenham for. I, I have, we had their preliminary budget was um, was above the index, but I don't know what their proposed final is. And I haven't um, investigated that one. I know some of the upper um, Montgomery County, such as Pottstown, are lower than the two percent. John. So uh, if this were just much of a difference, but. I think everybody needs to remember that this compounds. compounds. It cum yes. well accumulates. Yes. It's not really compounding. So we will lose that same amount that we don't take this year, every year going forward. And I kind of agree with what Brenda said. Until we until we have some additional revenue from some of the construction projects, I and while we have a construction project and steel prices are going up and there's competition and there's decisions to be made because right now we're over our original projection. I, I think we should not go be below the uh, Act 1 index. These are all very good things to consider, which we have a lot of consideration to do on this. Thank you, Ms. Bray. If we have no other comments or questions on the presentation or on... If I could speak yes, about the budget for please, just a few moments. So one of the things that the board knows is that I've given our administrators a target for hiring. Uh, we talked about um, the need to replace all of the seven positions that are being vacated. And in my analysis of how we've done hiring before, I think uh, processes have been good, but they can become better. And one of the things um, that we're doing, because we got out into the market earlier this year with um, retirements and looking for teachers, um, we are getting a good group of hiring. Um, one of the things that um, I feel really strongly about in any budget is the ability to preserve class sizes. We have a uh, cap of 22 at the primary level, 24 at intermediate. Those are really good class sizes when you look at a comparison of Chester, Bucks, Montgomery, and Delaware County. We're actually on the low end of all of those. And I think keeping us on the low end of those with the structures and reforms we're doing in the district will produce really good results. So I want to make sure that whatever budget that we approve moving forward will allow us to continue that same practice. 
Um, as of today, kindergarten numbers, we have four full sections at Fort Washington, and we may be looking at a fifth section of kindergarten, uh, depending upon final numbers there. Four at Maple Glen and three at both Jarrettown and Thomas Fitz comfortably. We're looking at some hot spots uh, and uh, looking at uh, where we might need some, some, ex some extra sections, and I'll be able to provide a little bit more uh, information in the next week or two uh, as we continue um, enrolling students. I want to give a uh, shout out to Maura, our uh, registrar, who has done a really great job connecting with daycares and, and preschools in the area to get, to get uh, students registered. The assessment appeals uh, do scare me a little bit. The one that we have tonight, um, it, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about a, uh, a list, quite a long list of some other ones that, uh, again, could have some drastic impacts on the budget. I think we also want to make sure that we're carefully considering the labor agreements that we have in place. We have um, a settled teacher's contract for the next four years. We're, we'll be moving into the second year of the UDESPA contract, and the Act 93 agreement is up next year, so I think we have to be mindful of all of those things. We'll be taking on some more debt service as we, as, as we continue to borrow uh, money for Sandy Run. So I want to be careful that we continue to look at that, at that line item um, as well. Some good news, we've been able to reduce administrative costs for next year. With the retirements that we saw, Ms. Bray, I think we're down $60,000 uh, in terms of administrative costs for next year. That's correct. Uh, and as, as we've said before, we don't know where we're going to be with construction, uh, with tariffs, and any, other, uh, any number of other economic conditions. So I'm not giving a recommendation. I just felt uh, that I wanted to convey those points as we go through this next month. Um, I can assure you that uh, Ms. Bray and Mrs. Baldassano have been analyzing the budget. I've been analyzing the budget, and our uh, new CFO, Mr. Leckman, has also been looking at the budget. Um, and the board will receive more frequent updates around staffing and other major impacts to the budgets moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Yanni. Okay, I guess we're ready to move on then. Um, Ms. Bray, do we have any announcements? Not this evening. We have minutes from April 25th. If you have any comments or changes to those, please let Brooke know. Um, we'll move on uh, to the recommendations that are going to come up at the meeting on Monday. Uh, the treasurer's reports. I don't know if you have any comments for that. No? That's Do you it. have any questions? Uh, the one comment I would make on the general fund is please note that uh, our spending and our trends are very comparable to last year with the exception of transfers, which uh, after Monday night will even bring those in line as well. Okay. Anyone with comments or questions well. there? Okay. Um, the next item is the frontline time attendance software. It's hard to believe that in 2019 we are still using paper time cards and it's long past time to um, move into something um, much more modern. Uh, we spend entirely too much time uh, calculating payroll manually and then having to check and recheck it. Um, it, we did have a different system down uh, in transportation where a number of individuals obviously punch in and punch out a, a couple of times a day. But um, that time clock um, broke and uh, it's of the vintage that it's not able to be fixed. So there's been um, other, we've used other front line I believe in our um, attendance or uh, Absence, we've been using absence for ASOP as it used to be known for a number of years. And I think we're even using this for applications that, that uh, so this would just be another module uh, and we would be using this as for transportation as I already mentioned, but for custodians, um, food service immediately. And there may be others such as um, uh, educational assistance or maybe other ways that we can use it. Um, I probably should turn the mic over to Ms. Baldassano um, because she's going to be doing a lot of the work with uh, Ms. Fredrickson and we're doing a lot of software changes uh, this spring. 
but uh, on the back end, it will be automatically uploaded the information into um, our eFinance, and it will make things much more streamlined, um, more efficient, and eliminate human error, which is always a very positive thing. So this is something that will make life a little easier? For a lot of people, lot I was just going to say, yes. will employees have an, a, a training to go through? Or yeah, it, it's very easy. Basically, it's your uh, badge, and it'll be uh, like a little kiosk. I forget what it is, but you just swipe your badge, and you can punch in. Oh, that's good. Um, the system will be able to track time, reporting. You'll be able to run reports, and then uh, the managers will be able to go in and see if someone missed, like if they didn't punch in or clock in that they can see what the reason was that they were out because it would interface with our attendance software. So then they would know that it was a personal day or vacation day. Um, currently the secretaries, I know in transportation, she spends two or three days doing one week of payroll and it's mm -hmm. taking the cards, calculating and putting it into Excel, sending the sheet over to us to payroll and then, then that's keyed into the system. So it's very... Oh. Time wow, what me. year is that? <laughs> it's very, yes, it, it's long overdue. Okay. So, yes. That's good. Any any comments or questions about the software? No? I guess we'll move this forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Tizia? Yeah. Um, if this is so time-consuming, are we then also looking at savings in personnel cost? No, it would free up time for them to do other things that are needed as well. But, yeah. No, we're not considering Yeah. <laughs> Not replacing. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no other comments or questions, we'll move that forward to Monday night. Um, we now have item C, which is the assessment appeal. <laughs> I, and what is attached to the um, agenda this evening is a draft. I now have uh, a finalized document that will be before the board on Monday evening for approval. It really hasn't changed. There's just a okay. couple of, of, of minor points. Uh, legalese. But in addition to that, uh, there will be another document, a, a letter um, authorizing our solicitor to negotiate or request that instead of making a cash payment that we can uh, ha accept credits. And um, the main thing is we're already talking about it and negotiating that with the attorneys of the owners, but it is a document that they will need to sign that they agree. So the credits to aren't a definite yet. N no. Okay. But not a, not at this point. And there will be two motions on Monday night to take care of this. Any questions or comments about this? We've talked about it for a while. No, I know. It'll be great to have this one behind us. Oh. Yeah. Yes, it will. Ironically, for those of you who have been on the board and have heard and the public about Hub, um, mm -hmm. this one at nineteen million dollars is quite similar to the amount that we went through with that. The difference is, and one of the key points, is that we're wrapping this up in only five years right. versus 12. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, a very positive step. Okay. There being no other comments or questions on this, we'll move this forward also for Monday. We have item D now, um, the agreement, the service agreement with Lukens and Wolf, who we know well. And this is really ratification. I've already uh, signed it. Uh, th this assessment appeal is the opposite of um, the one uh, we've just been spending a lot of time discussing. Um, the school district filed the appeal, and we are hopeful that we would uh, end up seeing uh, increased revenue when this one is settled. So, uh, Lukens and Wolf, we needed to get started on it. Um, we. There will be interrogatories and other things that need to be answered. So that's why that's before you as a ratification rather than waiting. Does anyone have any questions on this one? No? Okay. If that's all right, then we'll move this forward also for Monday. Um, item E, this is the Health Insurance Rate Stabilization Fund. Very important. Yes, it, it, it certainly is important in the same explanation that you have seen. It's the only commitment uh, that's permitted to not have an amount attached to it at the time that, it, at the time that it's uh, passed. Uh, how this works is that you have the option then when the audit is finished at determining the amount that you would like um, 
that should be put aside to further uh, stabilize um, the cost of medical. Um, we've done quite well in putting aside $2.6 million. Uh, also within the trust from the consortium, the amount has grown from being a, a rather minimum $400,000 to, at the end of February, about $1.2 million. So that will be something that you will want to um, also consider uh, after we get through the year and the reconciliation that needs to happen, uh, which will be sometime in August or so, um, that that will all blend in and um, be part of the decision. Um, Mr. Luckman and I have had some crossover time, and this is one of the things that we have been um, discussing already as um, we look forward to next year's budget. Anyone with comments, questions? Okay, that, that being that the case, we'll move that forward also for Monday. Um, now we have two transfers to discuss. <coughs> General fund to the debt service fund. The first one is, um, as you just said, and the amounts of $250,000, which has been budgeted all year as a budgetary reserve. Last year we moved that amount to um, debt service as well. And then the real estate revenue uh, from the Fort Washington Office Park, that $447,000, um, which in the future will be used to um, finance debt for our Sandy Run Middle School. Anyone with comments? When we've looked at the debt schedules, when we've looked at borrowing, that um, $447,000 has been included as one of the offsetting revenues um, in those last columns. Has, it, has the budgetary reserve been included in those? It has or, not. I didn't think so. Okay. Um, you could do that, but it's... Right, I know it's, it's there for a reason. For yes. a safety yeah. valve. And it's, yeah. <laughs> as the budget grows, the safety valve of a quarter of a million becomes yeah, less significant. It's a little small. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Then the uh, transfer from the general fund to the capital projects fund. Again, it's that amount that we refer to as the debt fall off from the year 2015-16. Um, I would expect that, although I don't have my crystal ball, but I would expect that it would be the last uh, time the transfer would take place to capital. Um, but moving forward, we will still need to find revenues or find resources, excuse me, because obviously there's still a lot of work to be done in the other buildings. And if I could, you know, use one more plug for going to the index because of the those things down the That's line that need to be done to at the other, at the three elementary schools. Yeah, that is good to consider. True. Any questions? No? All right. We'll move that one forward. And then now we have last but not least the solicitor proposal. Yes. Um, it came in a, a just barely in time to get it on the agenda for this meeting, and we would have included it for the legislative meeting. Um, it's explanatory. The hourly rates are 185 per hour for partners, as it's laid out there. Um, I think Whistler has been our solicitor for 35 years or so. Um, so you can read more about that within um, the memo that's attached as well. I think I don't think they've raised the rate in quite a while. Am I four years? Four four years. years. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I was looking for that because I forgot yeah. to look beforehand. Does if, anyone have any questions? If I could just interject, yes. the uh, solicitor proposal that you have there um, is for general services, construction, and whatnot. We've made the decision, the collective decision. Um, administratively to move away from Whistler Pearlstein for special education uh, legal assistance and we'll be moving forward with Sweet Stevens. Um, in fact, the board will uh, get receive more information about that um, and we expect to bring uh, a proposal from Sweet Stevens either Monday night or uh, at our June meeting. So that would be like it would start right away then? Assuming yes, it was approved. yes. So uh, Mr. Roos and uh, Ms. Brooks, who uh, supports us in special ed, uh, will be working with uh, the folks at Sweet Stevens to transition cases. Gotcha. Anyone with questions, comments? No. Okay. I don't see any, so I, we'll move that one forward. Um, now we're coming to community input. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to s speak, come to the microphone. Jen Cousins, Fort Washington. I just had a question. How um, how many new properties did come online over this 
school year. I just find it interesting that we have the same exact number of properties that transferred. So I'm just wondering if we've been keeping track of that at all, like how many came on and I don't know. I just feel like it's something we might want to watch because we're banking on these new projects for additional funds and it seems like, at least to this point, it's been a wash so far. Um, so that's one. And then I'm just wondering, how much extra does Title I get us in Title Three and Four per building? Just curious what that looks like. And I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. There, there's no one else in the audience then to come up. <laughs> <laughs> so we will close community input. Um, do we have any answer on the properties? Go ahead. Um, the properties for Homestead have to be certified. Uh, everyone has to fill out the forms and, and uh, turn them in to the county, and then the county sends us the list. This is nothing that's run through the school district. Um, so, and every year we do compare particular um, the list, but we have to take the certification. It's under Act One of 2006. That's how it works, um, and that's the reason why in December we often talk about making sure everyone who's bought a home um, that they be sure to uh, file for the uh, exclusion. And to further, just so everyone knows, all new properties that have gone through the real estate transfer tax during the year will receive um, a homestead exclusion form to be mailed to their house. So we spend several thousand dollars to making sure that that's covered. It might be worth mentioning that the even if the number of approved homesteads has remained flat, that doesn't mean the, that the assessment base has remained flat. No, so, absolutely not. I'm, I'm, yeah. they're, they're not related. Right. Okay. Oh, that's what you were going to say. Okay. Um, Dr. Yanni, I don't know if you have any comments regarding Title I and... I believe, and I'm looking over at Ms. Baldessando, I believe uh, Title I is about a half a million dollars. So this year we have two Title I schools, Thomas Fitzwater and Fort Washington Elementary. Every year we have to run our free and reduced lunch numbers uh, through a formula. And so um, what we do is we direct those uh, funds to pay for uh, an additional reading specialist in each of those buildings. Do, do I'm sorry? Title four. Oh, Title two and Title four. Yeah, they're they're they pale in comparison. Looking at the numbers right now, um, Title one budgeted for next year's two hundred thousand dollars. Title two sixty seven thousand dollars. Title three four thousand dollars. Yes, um, I'm sorry. So uh, the the amounts are small. So, yeah. Does the professional development part have to be used at the title schools? No, the um, the the title uh, or the title money that can be used for professional development have to be used for very specific professional development purposes. But it does not have to be used exclusively for folks that teach at Title One schools. What's very interesting over the years, sometimes Jarrettown is a Title I school, sometimes Jarrettown is not a Title I school. And so one of the things that we're looking at um, through the staffing process, the only thing it affects right now is if you have one and a half reading specialists or if you have two reading specialists. Um, when we actually look at reading specialist to student ratio, um, we, we believe, I believe, uh, and our elementary principals believe that um, even our non-Title I building should have two uh, reading specialists just to support students. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions from the board? Okay. I, s I don't see anyone else. I'm so sorry. Can I just say one more oh, thing? Yes, I know you Dr. want to wrap Annie, up. Of course. I know, Mr. Robsky. I know, but this is my moment. Uh, <laughs> Um, the question um, that was asked before, and I believe it was uh, Mrs. Sherpier who asked about um, would some of the efficiency mean that we would be looking at staff? Um, I want to preface my next comment by saying I, I don't say this to alarm anyone, but you know we have to be agile as a district when it comes to staff, and much like we looked at our administrative staff this year and brought forth recommendations, we're going to be doing that for professional and support staff. The intent is not to get rid of positions to save money, but the intent is really to make sure that we're right-sizing the district so that we have the supports in place to help kids and to make sure that we're getting um, the productivity out of each position in the district that we should be getting. 
Thank you, Dr. Yanni. If, I would if, hope that we, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, that we do have the funds to be able to uh, have a second tech support person, uh, instructional tech support person. That's on the priority list if we can make it happen with, through, with our current staffing numbers. Ms. Bray? I just wanted to point out that um, the amount of time that we're spending on in payroll, th there's certainly other tasks that those individuals can do. And sometimes um, to get it all done, it results in overtime. So any reduction of overtime would certainly be a savings um, when that occurs. Uh, and we are always looking to try to um, make things more efficient and take care and use technology when we can. Uh, right sizing is very important and also continuing to bring all the job descriptions up to 2019-2020 standards is uh, should be part of that. Yes, agreed. Okay, um, there being no further comments or questions, uh, we will meet again on June 20th.